Welcome. Today's webinar, Palliative Care in the Dakotas, is hosted by Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, Quality Improvement Organization for North Dakota and South Dakota. My name is Jennifer Lochner. I'm a Quality Improvement Advisor for Great Plains QIN, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping items to review. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted within one to two business days on our website at Great Plains greatplainsqin.org. All lines will be muted throughout the presentation. Questions and comments can be added to the question chat box and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. We have added a few resources handouts that you can access via the handouts tab of your GoToWebinar dashboard panel. Great Plains QIN aims to achieve better healthcare, improved health, safer care, and lower healthcare costs. We wanted to take a minute to remind you that we are your healthcare partner and plan to support and assist you in your organization. We continue to use the Age-Friendly Health Systems 4Ms framework as a model for assistance and improvement. As it pertains to today's call, what matters, one of the Ms, which directly relates to the purpose of today's webinar and why we are here. We are fortunate to have robust and accomplished specialty palliative care programs, as well as primary care programs in the Dakotas. During this session, program leaders will highlight the definitions and benefits of palliative care, offer practical application tips, and identify a multitude of resources and training opportunities for individuals and professionals. Today's webinar will address the, and offer the following. Describe palliative care and palliative care specialty services, Identify and benefit the value of palliative care services. Identify available resources and training opportunities in the Dakotas. Now I get the pleasure of introducing our speakers today. We have included a bio for our speakers in the handouts tab of your GoToWebinar panel. Rather than read the bios for each of our presenters, I will simply introduce each. Charlene Bierke, Project Director of the South Dakota Palliative Care Network and works with the Upper Midwest Palliative Care Education Network. Dr. Sarah Molman, Co-Project Director of the South Dakota Palliative Care Network and works for South Dakota State University College of Nursing Program. Mary Pernaud, Network Director of the South Dakota Palliative Care Network and Nancy Joyner, University of North Dakota, Center for Rural Health Palliative Care Outreach Specialist. Now I'm going to turn it over to our speakers. Thank you, Jennifer. Can you hear me? Okay. Excellent. Yes, we can. Um, thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead um, and are we not doing the poll question? I, I'm sorry. I thought it's the poll sure question. Let's start with a poll question and I'll launch that, if that's okay. All right, here we go. Yes. So the poll question is, what is true about palliative care? Delivered at the same time as curative treatment. Two, the goal of palliative care is improving quality of life. Three, it is my responsibility to provide palliative care. And four, palliative care and hospice care are the same. So if everyone you may wants to take certainly it, you select more than one answer. Yep, perfect. And Mary, we've got about 50% of our audience members that have voted. So once we get them all in, I'll close it out and then I'll share the results. Thank you. You bet. All right, I'm going to close it out in about five seconds. Three, two, close and then I'll share the results. And Mary, hopefully you can excellent. see them. I can, and they and excellent, you guys are good. Um, the correct answers are number two, the goal of palliative care is improving quality of life. Number three is also a correct answer. It is my responsibility to provide palliative care. So thank you for responding to that, and um, we'll be available for questions afterwards if our presentation um, does not further answer those questions for you. 
Moving on, 50 years ago, the leading causes of death in Americans was heart disease, cancer, respiratory failure, and stroke. They remain the leading causes of death today. Fortunately, due to the advancements of medical technology, people are living longer with these same diseases, and they're learning to live with them every single day. But that does not mean, and that does not come without the need to make sure that there's a good quality of life while they are living with that disease. A diagnosis of any serious illness, whether it's a new diagnosis or the worsening of a previous diagnosis, is incredibly frightening for both the patient and their caregiver or their family member. Patients often feel numb after that conversation, after that diagnosis, and they question where to go from, from there. How do I navigate this? Um, often different specialists are getting involved. There's different scans and labs being ordered. There's different medications to be um, added, and it becomes very overwhelming for a patient. Palliative care is navigating this life after that diagnosis, whatever that diagnosis may be. Often we think of cancer, but palliative care is appropriate at any serious illness. Um, it may be heart disease, it may be COPD, it may be a renal failure, and that list can go on and on. And it, so it may be true that that serious illness that they've been diagnosed with um, cannot be cured in and of itself, but that doesn't mean that there are not things that can be done and decisions that need to be made along the way as they proceed um, with this um, the newest, newer diagnosis. So we're going to go on to the next slide, and I'm going to read the definition for palliative care. This was put together by um, a team of a lot of specialty um, palliative physicians in North and South Dakota, along with some leaders in the palliative care world. Palliative care is medical care for people living with serious illness. This type of care is focused on providing relief from the symptoms and stress of illness with the goal to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family. Effective palliative care is delivered by a trained team of doctors, APPs, nurses, social workers, chaplains, and other health professionals who collaborate together to provide an extra layer of support. This is based on the needs of the patient, not on the prognosis. Palliative care is appropriate at any stage um, and any age of serious illness and may be provided alongside curative treatments in both the primary and the specialty settings. One of my favorite parts of this definition is at the bottom where it talks about the Latin root of the word palliative, and that is to cloak or to cover, to, to alleviate, to reduce the, the violence or the burden um, of the one who suffers. And so that is that Latin word is something that really does um, kind of uh, define what palliative care is. If you go, if you go to the next screen, sorry, I appreciate that. In that definition, um, it talks about the serious illness, and so um, the, the the serious illness is defined um, by a health condition that carries a high risk of mortality and either negatively impacts a person's daily function or his quality of life, or it excessively strains the caregiver. So a few common scenarios where we would consider a palliative care or a palliative care approach may be a late stage cancer, or it may be um, a, a patient who needs to start dialysis or is, is currently getting dialysis, maybe a feeding tube or the need for some mechanical ventilation. Anytime the patient is elderly or has multiple comorbidities, we need to revisit that plan of care and those and have some goals of care conversations. These are situations where um, palliative can be very beneficial. Uh, the palliative care approach allows the family and their provider and the patient to sit down and discuss those goals of care, to discuss what quality of life is, to discuss what support systems are out there, and also to provide informed consent so what they are consenting to, that next plan of care, they are well informed of what that looks like. When faced with a serious illness, the stress on the patient is certainly more than just the disease. It's the impact it's going to have on the rest of the family. It's the social implications. It's the emotional stress. It's often financial stress. It's spiritual stress. And this is where we start discussing whole person care. Whole per go ahead and go to the next slide, Sarah. Whole person approach to care means that we do not necessarily treat that disease in and of itself. Rather, we treat the symptoms that are surrounding that disease. 
So a reminder also that we're, when we're practicing with a palliative approach, the patient may very well still have their specialist that is treating their disease. So cancer patients may still be seeing their oncologist. COPD patients will have their pulmonologist. Um, CHF patient or heart failure patients may still be taking their beta blockers and seeing cardiology. A palliative approach doesn't necessarily mean that the palliative care team is treating that specific illness and they're not necessarily curing that disease itself. Rather, they're focusing on the symptoms surrounding the disease. I always say everything I needed to know um, in nursing or, or, or in this world, um, I learned from my patients. And when I was a fairly new nurse, um, I learned from a patient one of my greatest lessons in whole person care. And this is Bob's story. Um, Bob was a patient of mine. I don't exactly even remember what his primary diagnosis was, but I had gotten to know him over several months of visiting him in his home. And, and there's just nothing better than being on their turf and, and their comfort zone. Um, so I went to his home to visit him. Um, and while I was going through my, my checklist of questions, which we do, um, I asked him a routine question that we often ask our patients, and that is, I said, Bob, do you have any pain? And he was quite quiet, thinking he didn't hear me. I asked him again, I said, Bob, do you have any pain today? Finally, it was silent for a while, and he goes, I don't really know how to answer that. He said, if I say yes, I have pain, you're going to ask me where my pain is. But am I comfortable? Absolutely not. I'm frustrated with my diagnosis. I feel very hopeless right now. I am so tired, it hurts. I don't sleep and the meds don't help. I'm scared about my finances. I'm worried about my family. I lay in this chair so much that my back aches, but I'm too weak to walk. My bowels are a mess. And then you come in and you ask me if I have pain. How about asking me if I'm comfortable instead? And we literally sat there in silence for about 30 seconds. And I said, Bob, are you comfortable? And he said, no. That is whole person care. The physical aspect is just one part of taking care of these patients with a serious illness. Palliative care looks at the whole person along with the family when caring for patients. It's a different approach to care, and it carries throughout that patient's um, life. Um, and it carries throughout that what may be a hospice time. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy, and she's going to discuss how that continuation of care um, moves forward. So take it away, Nancy. Thank you, Mary. I'm going to start with a video. I'm a, a very good one into using all our senses. So um, Sarah, if you would run this, please. <laughs> You are a bitch. It's true, or at least it's a good analogy. When you're healthy, when the bridge is sound, you can handle anything. Cars, trucks, trains, all the bumps of life. No problem. You are set. But if you're facing a serious health issue, something like kidney disease, lung disease, cancer, the bridge starts to alter, cracks appear, and pretty soon it's hard to withstand all that tra traffic that includes your own medical treatment. And that's where palliative care comes in. Palliative care is a specialized form of medical care, specifically designed for people with serious illnesses. Its main goal is to improve your quality of life by providing relief from the symptoms, pain, and stress that are an inevitable byproduct of both the disease and the medical intervention. In short, palliative care provides support for your bridge. And when a bridge Did I just stop? Yeah, um, 
uh, we do have it in your references. I highly recommend, you know, technology all this time, you know, we never know what's going to happen. It's a fantastic video. It's av available on the getpalliativecare.org website. Um, I was lucky enough. Sarah, can you go back just the, the one page <clears throat> to the, to the uh, video? At the top, it was originally done by the Minnesota Network of Hospice and Palliative Care back in 2015. And I remember the first time we all viewed it, we were so excited at one of their network conferences and it became viral. Uh, the Center to Advance Palliative Care, CAPSI has it. It's now on the getpalliativecare.org website. Uh, highly recommend it and share it with lots of people. People get it that way. So this is sometimes a way, along with everything Mary said with her story and the information we have, to give some visuals to help people along the way. So highly recommend that you do watch it on your own as well. Next slide, please. As it said in there, and what we've been talking about is this isn't, you know, it, it takes a community to, to raise a village. It takes the interdisciplinary team to do this. It takes all of us. The nurses, we all often forget the pharmacists, a very important part of that. Uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, iotherapy dog, you know, there are all kinds of different components of it. We use psychologists, psychiatrists, dietitians, art therapy, definitely the, the social worker. We often use a child life specialist, and it isn't even just for the patient, it's for the family as well, too. We used our patient, um, our child life specialist, to introduce what they're going to see before they walk in the room and, and are a little startled sometimes with uh, what they may see. Definitely our chaplain and uh, spiritual support in any way that they do, including within the community. And so we, we reach out to people according to what the person would like. Definitely using dignity with that, our physician and music therapy. So there are many, many, and I'm sure you can think of more as you go along, but the whole idea is that it's a team approach. It takes all of us working together to make that holistic care as we, as Mary described earlier. Next slide, please. The next part is that community though is person-centric. The second bullet there, as the lens through which the, their needs are assessed, it's not by what our agenda is, it's what they're telling us. You know, the person that is living with a serious illness, you know, not only where they live, you know, with our very rural frontier areas in our Dakotas here, but what setting are they in? Are they in their own home? Are they living with children? Are they in a long-term care facility? All of these things can definitely impact where that person is. What is their condition? Are they early in the serious illness? Are they along the, the journey that is there? Definitely ethnicity and gender can add to that. The disease and comorbidities that go along with it as well. And age, you know, definitely age. I have taken care of um, two weeks old um, children incompatible with life, all the way up to 109 year old is the oldest person that I've taken care of. And what kind of organization is supporting them? Are we using community-based palliative care and rural settings? Are we looking at inpatient? Are we looking at clinic settings? Wherever we are, we should be able to offer palliative care. So it's from the lens of the needs of that person. And the, and the other can go on and on and on. So that community is definitely, you know, so it's always individualized. It'll never be the same. Every person we see is going to be different than the next person that we see. Next slide, please. So many times people get the two confused. Is it palliative care or hospice? And so it's important for us to get a real feeling about that because all of hospice is palliative care, but not all palliative care is hospice. Worth repeating, all of hospice is palliative care, but not all palliative care is hospice. Next slide, please. There's actually in 2021, a medical definition of hospice that has come out. It's care designed to give supportive care to people in the final phase of a terminal illness and focus on comfort and quality of life rather than cure. The goal is to enable patients to be comfortable and free of pain so that they live each day as fully as possible. It's the journey going forward. We often say death and dying, but it's, it's the dying process, you know, and same with we say hospice and palliative care, but it's the journey along the way that's there. And interesting, like, like Mary pointed out, the Latin roots make a difference. Hospice means to host or be a guest. We are a guest when we're in somebody's home. We are a guest in helping them along the journey in the role of hospice. Next slide, please. 
this is a, a diagram that we came up with from um, North Dakota to include the palliative care continuum timeline. We uh, developed it with several other uh, diagrams that are out there. We worked with the, um, Dr. Diane Meyer from the Center to Advance Palliative Care, and we included things from you know, prevention and screening when people are healthy, how the focus changes. Initially, we have a lot of focus on curative, life prolonging, and you notice the dotted line that people pass back and forth between it. The palliative focus is that support along the way, the comfort, the supportive treatments that we're doing it along the way. So they never are it totally separate as, as such. As a person gets nearing the end of life is the time that we have come up with a, a hospice Medicare benefit that says, you know, would you be surprised in the next six months? And so that care changes over until the time the person dies and then bereavement continues. All of this colored area is palliative care. This is all palliative care continuum. So from the beginning, when you have prevention and screening, when you have your Band-Aid on, you know, that is still part of palliative care, the, the comfort along with trying to life prolong and fix things all the way to nearing the end of life. Next slide, please. There are things that really distinguish palliative care from hospice. And I, I like to, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on the palliative care side because it's very important. Who qualifies? Anyone at any age living with a serious illness. And we define what serious illness is. Hospice is those with that life expectancy of months, not years, with usually a terminal condition. When to start it? From the time of diagnosis through treatment and living with a serious illness. You know, that the focus is not on the disease, it's on the person. It's not based on prognosis. With hospice care, the choice has to be made. Um, to stop or with, um, go without curative treatments for at least one of the diagnoses that are there. A re referral required? Palliative care? Not truly, but it, because it's a team approach, we all want to be on the same team. <clears throat> so we often will work with them, you know, to see if it's available in the area. Do we need to do any virtual things? What is it that we can be able to offer them? Hospice care does require a referral. There's a, you have to be a, uh, truly a Medicare guru to know all the, the qualifications for that. And so it does require an order to move forward. The additional goals are the ones I really wanna stress though. The advanced care planning component. It's not just about the healthcare directive, but the, again, the journey from the time you're 18 on, you know, having those conversations and what's ahead for goals of care. Information about the diagnosis and prognosis. So many times we're here, the person we're taking care of and their family is here, we're helping them with the journey of how to get there and they're not always at the same place. So we navigate the treatment options, which do include opting out, time-limited trials, all of those things that people need to be aware of. And then referrals to community resources. So many people don't know what they don't know. And so by able, being able to offer that to people, we have that continuity of care that will be there and to, to continue across the, the spectrum. In hospice care, compassionate comfort care is definitely takes focus. Everybody's always offered comfort, but now we're down to the point that treatment is choos, chosen is usually comfort measures only and that they're preparing for that journey nearing the end of life. Next slide, please. Most of us truly understand modern medicine, you know, that curative, we're trying to fix disease, we're, we're trying to get a real hold on making sure that people are as comfortable as possible while making sure that we're, we're dizzy, um, dealing with whatever um, issues that go along the way. Hospice, the model came out from the, the 1980s where it is nearing the end of life that we focus on their comfort and the de definitions and things I just talked about. Um, one click, please. Palliative care encompasses both, which I really like. And they talked about it being the bridge between the two and making sure that people do have all the needs. Not all of modern medicine is palliative care. However, hospice is under the, the umbrella of palliative care itself. But the first time I learned about even the word palliative care, was palliative chemotherapy, palliative radiation. And I'm going, wait a second, explain that to me. I don't understand that. And so we needed to get more into the understanding of that to have clarification 
of where our goals are and what direction we are on the journey of serious illness. From now, then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah. Thank you, Mary and Nancy, for giving that background on palliative care. And if anybody's listening to this and thinking, boy, how do I deliver palliative care? We want to make an important distinguishing factor here before we move forward. And that's differentiating primary and specialty palliative care. So I'm going to start with specialty palliative care. We really think of that as those trained, being fellowship trained, specialty palliative care providers that are most likely in our urban settings, right? Um, they have that full interdisciplinary team. They've got the resource and the infrastructure built to give that specialty palliative care. And they're really for those complex patient scenarios. The scenario on the screen here is an oncology one, but again, going back to what Mary and Nancy said, it's not just oncology, this is just a good uh, table. What I wanna spend a little bit of time on is primary palliative care. Again, this can be for all patients, diagnosis through survivorship or end of life care. Um, it's really for anybody who's providing care. So all of our primary providers, especially in rural states like North and South Dakota, we're imploring to start providing primary palliative care Otherwise, those patients and their families will not have access to palliative care. And we recognize that there's lower resources. Um, there might be less people, um, less support groups, things like that. But I think also rural areas are very creative and know how to pull people together. And maybe it's pulling the chaplain out of a local church or social worker from a different facility and really trying to pull an interdisciplinary team together to be able to provide that primary palliative care, which again can be done in any setting. If you aren't quite sold yet, we're going to go into the benefits and value of palliative care. What does it do? Well, it addresses suffering, physical, psychological, and spiritual. It improves quality of life. It assesses, manages pain and other symptoms. And again, when we say symptom management, we're referring to physical, psychological, spiritual, maybe it's financial. Um, it's not just physical symptoms. It's usually using that team approach to care and really getting down to what the patient family decide or their goals of care. We aren't making those decisions. We're just supporting them to achieve those goals. That requires excellent communication and it allows that patient and family to make good decisions about their care. Some of the skills needed to provide palliative care are that pain and symptom management, relief of psychological, emotional, spiritual suffering. Again, that communication about goal setting and what to expect. And really, it's starting to have those conversations early. We don't expect these conversations to occur in one sitting. Um, this, as you know your patients so well and their families, it's getting them to have those conversations outside of the healthcare setting, figuring out what they want, and following up with that um, goals of care conversations later. It does provide support for the family caregivers, which is very essential. There's national movements to include family caregivers and um, the, because of the long-term stress and health consequences of being a caregiver. Palliative care also gives the practical and social support because we are looking at that holistic big picture of the patient and their family. When we look at benefits, and this is from CAPSI, um, palliative care reduces avoidable spending, it reduces use of overutilization, so it can decrease readmissions, costs, admissions and ED visits. And the one that I um, personally want to mention is that transfer. So my grandmother lived in a rural area and went into the ED a month before her 89th birthday with necrotizing colitis. And nobody gave her the option of not being transferred out. So they airlifted her out to the next largest facility where they did surgery. No one along the way asked her if that's what she wanted. So we really don't know if that's what she wanted, but she did get transferred away from her support system in that community she'd been involved with for a good 60 plus years. So I think that's what we need to look at. And I know in the current setting of the pandemic, some of those transfers just weren't able to happen because the larger facilities were overrun and weren't able to accept more patients. So I think the benefits of palliative care have really come to light during the pandemic. Palliative care is also covered under health insurance and it ensures value. 
both to the patients and the family and the healthcare system. For the patient and family, it focuses on the patient's values. It's not disease specific. Again, relieves that the symptoms and stress of a serious illness, improves the quality of life for both the patient and the family. What I find really fascinating is the research is showing now that if you provide palliative care for the family, those caregivers, you can actually improve the quality of life for the patient and sometimes even their survival. So really need to focus on the patient and the family and give them options for pain and symptom management, even if they're still pursuing curative measures. For the healthcare system, um, if you're having that decreased cost and utilization, but we also wanted to mention value-based care Palliative care really does ensure that. And as we move to value-based care, we think palliative care can be a bridge to make that happen. We kind of covered this a little bit, but and you, I feel like everybody kind of knows this, right? Why is palliative care needed? Because people are living longer and they're living longer, they're living with more serious and chronic illnesses. Our population is aging, especially in our rural communities. So again, that need for primary palliative care we have increased in costs of medical care that doesn't just impact the individuals and community, but also society. Our rural patients and families experience higher costs of medical care than their urban counterparts. And it's a holistic approach, so it will meet the needs, um, complex needs of patients and families. It has the skills, the processes, and the system improvements that will improve our healthcare system. So hopefully you're starting to think about, okay, how do I have knowledge, skills, and I'm ready to deliver palliative care? If not, I'm gonna turn it over to Charlene to share what palliative care resources and training opportunities there are in the Dakotas. Well, thank you, um, Mary, Nancy, and Sarah for covering the base and understanding of palliative care. So I have a pleasure sharing some of the resources and education opportunities that have been developed um, in the Dakotas. And I'll specifically share the ones that were developed in South Dakota. And my colleague Nancy will go over the ones in North Dakota. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, Sarah. So the South Dakota Palliative Care Network is focused on pulling together clinical practice partners in academia under the upper Midwest to improve awareness and knowledge of primary palliative care. <clears throat> the project is, has a three aim approach, is educating emerging healthcare professionals. So starting with the nursing programs at the South Dakota State University, Mount Mar Marty University and Presentation College in Aberdeen. The second is to provide continuing education for current healthcare professionals, which I'll share a little bit more about as we go forward. And then the third is educating in the communities. For specific information the pro on the project, check out one of the education um, PDFs that is in the resource and handouts. But one way to stay up to date as to what's happening in the Dakotas is to sign up for the newsletter. Um, Mary's email address is here on the bottom, so you can connect with her and sign up. It's very easy. Try to make it as easy as possible. Um, the good part is that newsletter goes out every couple months, so we won't fill up your email box, but um, if there is something that needs to be shared as soon as possible, we will do that. But we do filter a little bit. So if you want to go to the next one. So, um, there's a lot happening in regards to education um, in our Dakota area. And with the um, South Dakota Palliative Care Network, we were able to create a CE portal. I'll go a little bit more into that because I know a lot, a lot about that one later on. Um, we also do have a palliative care symposium. So I want to um, plug the date for November 17th, um, 2020 in Yankton. Um, it'll be on our on that link in there. We have a very funny um, motivational keynote speaker, um, Dr. Um, Braid Nady. Um, he has a kind of a humor sense um, with a medical background. Um, and it also is able to be able to join um, virtually. So um, that'll be there for you to check on. And then there is another, um, we're very blessed within um, 
South Dakota to have three grants that are focused on education. And then one of the projects is by the University of South Dakota Nursing Palliative uh, ECHO Project, so moving knowledge, not patients. And that fosters collaboration through the use of the ECHO framework for telementoring by connecting palliative care specialists to critical access communities to increase their knowledge on primary palliative care. This is being led by the University of South Dakota Nursing Department. They have a eight week or eight session once a month, and there's the link that's on there that will allow you to do the um, access that and register for those sessions. The next one is next Thursday on symptom management, promoting comfort. And then the third one is Advancing Palliative Care in the Native American Indians. It's an R01 um, NIH grant. And that study aims to understand perspectives from the Lakota cancer patients, caregivers, tribal leaders, and healers in the health and healthcare providers living with cancer. And they characterize by living well um, for, faced, for patients faced with cancer in the Cheyenne River Rosebud and Pine Ridge Reservations. They hope to learn um, information from the conversations in the community on palliative care education and then use those interventions um, that are culturally relevant for patients living with um, cancer and serious illness on the tribal lands within South Dakota and North Dakota. And those are included in the information um, handouts too. So if you want to go on to the next one. So this is the one, um, this is the online education on demand. And to sign up for this free education, you click on um, the link or the vera.cloud-cme.com. You need to create a account if you do not have one. All you need is an email address to sign in and create an account. So if you want to go to the next one, Sarah. So once you're signed in, um, you click on the palliative care education right at the top, so the big bold um, arrow. And since this is being funded by a grant, we need to collect some data. So we're gonna make you register for the series. You will receive a code and you'll use that code to access the education. And so you'll enter that code in each time. One of the things that um, as we roll out some of these education, one of the providers um, gave, quoted to me, and I'll repeat it, I have a strong preference for managing some elements of my primary care patient without specialty consultation. I have a clearer view now of how far to go and when I need to ask for assistance. And that just speaks volumes to the um, education that's being provided here. If you want to go to the next one, Sarah. So these are some of the education that are currently available. So um, the base one is what is palliative care, um, similar to what we just have done here, and then goes into a little bit more detail. We have created high quality education for the palliative care enthusiasts related to the clinical practice domains from the National Consensus Project for Quality Palliative Care. These are the ones that are currently available. We also have some that are coming in June in regards to pharmacology, Great Plains of Native American culture from a spiritual psychological lens, and then care of the patient nearing the end of life. These are all free opportunities for education, so please share them with colleagues or other palliative care enthusiasts. And now I'm going to turn it over to Nancy to share some of the resources that North Dakota has developed. Thanks, Charlene. We have some of the same um, topics, but a little bit different blend on how we did that. I uh, We had a palliative care task force up until 2017. We're trying to reestablish that again. We're looking at um, coalition and some other methods so that we do uh, get kind of an advisory council and, and move forward from there. You saw the, the part of the diagram of our, our flyer that includes both the definition, the diagram, and then that distinction component side by side. 
which has been very, very helpful. We've actually seen it being used in other states, so we're pretty excited about that. We have worked with a community-based palliative care uh, rural site. We worked with a product, project out of uh, Stratus Health to help us to build that, and we now have 11 different um, communities that have been able to establish, including in the frontier area, so we're pretty excited throughout North Dakota with that. With that, then, we did develop community-based palliative care resources so that people can see how to do it as a primary care versus do they need to reach out from, from a specialty perspective on that. We also have our Honoring Choices North Dakota, which gets into more of the advanced care planning and conversation pop, uh, part of what needs to go on with those conversations, how to do it right, you know, how to really have the, the conversation that makes sense for people. We have our Pulse program, which is for uh, those of you that are not familiar with Pulse, it's a medical order that's uh, transferable and moves with the person, and it's like an informed consent, specifically regarding things like CPR, uh, feeding tubes, et cetera, of that nature. So we have monthly education going on with that and all the resources available. Then we have our rural and palliative care website, uh, which is based out of also our um, RHI hub that's known nationally for that. And then from our, our we also have our rural community-based palliative care resource center that we share that comes from Stratus Health. So we're very happy to be able to have networking and ways to do that. Next slide, please. This is our education that we have right now. Uh, currently, we're uh, doing it specifically for rural populations on organizing palliative care. We also have used the national consensus guidelines with some of that. We've also included tribal and native components of it for our teleecho. Some of our previous palliative care, we used our statewide um, palliative care specialist including things like what if you don't have hospice, how can you do it, um, and providing that for people nearing the end of life and other symptoms that go along with that. The North Dakota Post, as we've talked about, we have awareness education implementation monthly with different individuals coming to attend. We address uh, questions from everything from a spiritual perspective um, to how, how do we have these good conversations. And Reverend Sarah Schwartz, shows how to script it, how to have these conversations and helps people that. We do have advanced care planning facilitator training. We've been using Respecting Choices. We are now um, implementing the Serious Illness Conversation Guide and ha have come to a certification for that. We just recently held a class and being, we used to do it face-to-face, -face, but now we did it virtually and we had them do self-study beforehand and then came to do the work. And we have 27 new um, skilled facilitators throughout our state. So we're very, very excited about that as well. And all of these um, resources will be available for you to be able to click and look at um, in, on screen um, through the um, handouts that are available today. Next slide, please. We really, there was a lot of information that we, we covered today. We hope we gave you a little bit more flavor of serious illness, palliative care, hospice, those different perspectives. I truly, Mary, your, your story with Bob is, is incredible. The whole idea of pain, comfort, discomfort, you know, that, that really ties everything together. And then to be able to know the differences between specialty and primary palliative care, where all of us are responsible to be able to do that. So these are things we need to really be looking at. And we gave you lots of resources for both North Dakota and South Dakota to do that. Next slide, please. When we're integrating this, it should be into all serious illness as a human right. Palliative care should see the person beyond the disease. It is fundamental shift in our healthcare de delivery. We should be whole person care, not based on disease. And it should not be dependent on prognosis and life-sustaining interventions. So it's appropriate at any age, any stage in a serious illness, and it's needed everywhere, wherever you practice, wherever you are. Um, Sarah gave the example of, you know, are we sharing this information? Do people know all their options no, ma no matter where you are? So people may need palliative care in the hospital, communities, nursing facilities, wherever they are. Thus, every one of us as clinicians 
need knowledge and skills in the fundamentals of palliative care. And this article done by Rosa Farrell and Mason is incredible. I highly recommend that you do look at it. And it covers, you know, what's happened during COVID and why we put even more emphasis on this and how important it is. Next slide, please. We have lots and lots of references for you. Uh, these also are available in your, um, your handouts. So we have resources and references. So we're not leaving you without tools. We are definitely giving you lots of things to be working on today. So there's that palliative care you are bridge. You click on that and you'll be able to see the, the video. Um, it is now through the Center to Advance Palliative Care and at, on the getpalliativecare.website. website. And that last article that I just talked to you about as well, too. So that should be the end. Sarah, you want to click us out? All start. right. This is Carrie McDermott with Great Plains Quinn, and I'll take it from here, Jennifer, if that's okay. Uh, thank you again, Mary, Nancy, Sarah, and Charlene. We greatly appreciate your help. Now we have a few minutes left to answer any questions from our audience. Um, you can add a question into the questions tab on your GoToWebinar dashboard um, off to the right of your screen. Um, I do have a couple questions in here uh, for our speakers, just so you know, there's five currently. So um, I will pass the questions along and you guys can decide who the best um, responder would be. Um, first is, has any other palliative care team shifted their service line from palliative care to supportive care in an effort to sidestep the negative stigma of hospice. We have considered this option, but want to ensure such a change would not impact Medicare billing. I can take that one. <laughs> we, we have had that conversation going on for a long time. We really are moving towards serious illness as our ultimate goal, because if you ch keep changing the verbiage, and supportive hospice gives supportive care, palliative gives supportive care. Serious illness is the big umbrella now, you know, that we need to do that. So we're trying not to, sh to shift it because I notice in, in I, I have a, um, a infectious disease doctor that always puts supportive care in his note every single time, but he's talking about all the different dy dynamics of it, not just the disease perspective of it. And so um, again, it's, it's the language that we, you know, um, even even the Center to Advance Palliative Care um, has shifted to using the terminology serious illness as the big umbrella where we all fall under at this point in time. That it's that integrity of the person, not just about the disease, not the timeline, not the prognosis that that needs to be really identified. So that that's my take on it, and that's what I've been hearing from national sp uh, speakers as well too. Excellent. Does anybody else want to add anything before I go to the next question? Uh, the question that, or the individual that asked the question responded, thank you. Uh, the next question is, is palliative care compatible with continuing dialysis? Nancy, are you okay? Uh, you can certainly chime in if you want. Um, in some ways, it depends on why they're getting dialysis. If, if it's a chronic dialysis patient, um, for an extended period of time, palliative care, is that what the question was, palliative care or hospice? Palliative care, right? Palliative care, um, yeah. It certainly, yeah, it certainly does align with that. Um, I, I will tell you personally, just, you know, I sat around a lot of kitchen tables with people who, were getting dialysis and said, I'm done. Um, this, this is more than I can do anymore. This is more than my family can do anymore. Sometimes they said, had I known what I was getting into, I would have never started dialysis. Um, and that goes back to that informed consent palliative conversation before you, you ever start treatment and to make sure that patient knows, under, understands what life is going to be like with something like dialysis. But because often patients struggle with their goals of care um, in the midst of dialysis, it's certainly appropriate to um, do them simultaneously. And sometimes it's a matter in an outpatient clinic of just, um, if there's a specialty outpatient clinic or if it's a primary care setting, to just really touch base with those patients on a regular basis of um, 
how how is it going? It it is dialysis is a serious illness and it's it does significantly change the quality of life. And so I think to to revisit that conversation frequently with those patients um, actually makes palliative care even more important to have with those patients than anything. Now, once you cross over into that hospice world, then generally dialysis would have to stop. And so a lot of times the palliative care team um, can walk that patient through that decision um, to stop dialysis and what to expect when that dialysis ends. And so it's certainly appropriate to have palliative on board for dialysis patients. If I may add, because this is one of my favorite ones, because I was one week I was taking care of um, uh, many patients, but three of them were all going to be offered dialysis. Three patients the same week, and all three of them said, whatever my family decides, and I'm going, oh, my God. You know, so we didn't even have the goals of conversation kind of thing, but whatever my family, and all, of course, all families said, yes, yes, let's try it. So the first, there were, um, one was a, a younger gentleman, um, and the two elders had been with chronic renal issues for a long time, but they just thought it might be beneficial. So the, the older woman that, I've, that I took care of went on dialysis, um, lived miles and miles away, but the family was able to do it. I followed her for months and months and months, and things stabilized, and she did really quite well with it. They were able to, with the family dynamics and everything, she was very rural set, but able to do it. The second woman um, never left the hospital, two weeks on dialysis, and um, passed away, which was very sad and died. The third gentleman, <laughs> he was my favorite cat. He, he tried it twice and said, no way, Jose, <laughs> and he stopped. He said, I don't care what my family says. So I, I just have to tell that story because it, it's just, it was so powerful by having those conversations, you know, to be able to sit down and say options, exactly like Sarah said, what are your options? But when they say what, you know, whatever my family decides, sometimes it's a little harder until they actually experience it. I think with dialysis is a good example as well of, I know in the specialty care programs and often the inpatient, to have that nephrologist um, kind of work hand in hand with the palliative physician or provider, excuse me, is advantageous. Um, often a patient goes on dialysis, it may not be a, a, a long-term um, issue. It may, it may be a, an acute dialysis in a, in a, um, in, in a sense that um, a, a primary care provider may not, or excuse me, a palliative care provider may not be able to have that discussion on dialysis, but they want to be there to help them make that decision. So um, I guess if you would say to me, do you want dialysis? I'm going to say, well, am I on it, you know, for, for the long haul? Or is this an acute situation to get me through to the next um, chapter? So um, I think that's a good example of when having um, maybe another physician who's trained in dialysis hand in hand with the palliative conversation is a, is a good thing if possible that's not always feasible but um, dialysis is a little gray that way awesome okay we do have a few more questions and a little bit of time left so i'm going to relay the next one can hospice and palliative care be offered or provided anywhere and are there limitations on who can serve on a palliative care team I can I can talk a little bit to that one and then others can add. Um, yes, I mean that was the whole premise of our of our discussion today and is imploring people to to gain those skills to perform that palliative care. And you know, hospice, if you're talking, is there home health hospice? That really depends where you're at. Is there a hospice, you know, inpatient hospice facility really depends where you're at. Um, I'm not gonna speak to that. Um, you know, but I know of a home health agency in Face, South Dakota, who's almost doing hospice. They won't, she hasn't quite gone to being designated as providing hospice, but they do their very best and serve five counties in Western South Dakota. I'm, I'm just um, amazed by the work they do. So yes, um, for those complex patients that you need additional help with, you could consult or refer to specialty palliative care. It just depends which one's the closest to where you're at. And then maybe hopefully they provide some telehealth if they have the ability, the bandwidth to kind of do that. Um, that depends on each specialty palliative care team. Uh, does anybody else want to add anything else? No, thank you, Sarah. 
Uh, the next question says, I don't reside in the Dakotas. Can I still attend the education offered, access the, the modules, or attend the November events in South Dakota? I can take that. Yes, you can. <laughs> as long as you have an email address, you can sign up to that um, CE portal. And um, the one in November will be offered as a hybrid, so it will be um, virtual also. So could attend from anywhere within the United States or Mexico or Canada, wherever you want to spend your November time in. I don't know where you reside, but we're November in South Dakota, you might want to bring a coat. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so we have one more question and I think we do have time for it. It is, how do you best justify a palliative care team to your healthcare system or within my facility? Is it dollars saved? Does it reduce admissions, readmissions, et cetera? It is all of those. Um, uh, selling a palliative care program to an administration um, is, is an art, not a science. Um, we, we often say that you need two things for a successful palliative care program in any study, in any healthcare system. What is a, a champion provider who is going to um, go to bat for the passion of palliative care? The second is an administrative who's willing, administration who's willing to take that risk. Um, it's hard to put on paper exact dollars saved. Um, it's hard to, to put on paper how much money you're going to save with reduced ER admissions. Um, we all know that there's reduced ER admissions, but it, how, how you put that on paper is, is hard. If you go to some of the national websites, um, for instance, we've talked a little bit about the Center for Advancing Palliative Care. There are some needs assessments on there. There's some um, different resources that you can use for um, administration to partner with them. It, it really does take both sides, the administrative and the clinical side, to come together. Um, and there's a lot of resources out there on national websites. I would recommend the, the CAPSI website um, as probably um, the one that we have used the most um, to, to really put forward, a, um, put forward essentially a report to administration for, for selling this program. And, and on their website, they actually do making the case for, are you looking at hospital-based, community-based? They have great resources and references. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, which is really, really nice. But I agree totally with Mary. You need to have your advocate and somebody at administration saying, we've got to look into this. You know, you definitely need those two components to move forward. As we close out the question session, a reminder that attendees will receive a certificate of participation for submission to applicable accrediting licensing bodies for CE credit. This certificate will be sent via email. Great Plains Quality Innovation Network is an approved provider of continuing education with the North Dakota Board of Examiners for Nursing Home Administrators and the South Dakota Board of Nursing Facility Administrators. After the session ends, Attendees will be dropped off at our webinar evaluation. Please complete to help us plan and coordinate future events. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks to our speakers for your time today and your work you are doing and for sharing your expertise with us. Enjoy your day. Thank you much. Thank you.